Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show. This is episode number 237, and I'm your host and reporter, Jason Hartman. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I got a lot of great feedback on the last several shows, really, but the last show, number 236 as well, with Rich Dad author Ken McElroy. Had a great breakfast with him last week and really enjoyed him, and I even asked him if he wanted to come and speak at our Meet the Masters event, which is coming up in March, and he's checking his schedule. So I'm not saying that he is but he is checking into it. By the way, we just posted that on the website for the Hyatt Regency Irvine for March 24th and 25th. However, and this is a big giant however, one of our speakers instantly said, you know what, that's spring break for a lot of people and you might want to switch the date. So I called the hotel and we're thinking of switching it to the weekend of, I guess that's March 10th and 11th, two weeks earlier. So if you have any feedback on that, let us know really fast. Go to jasonhartman.com, fill out the contact us form and just write your comments in there and let us know. Or if you're working with our investment counselors, give them some feedback and we will be happy to take that into consideration. So it will be in March, Hyatt Regency Irvine, our usual venue. You know, we were thinking of doing that event in the greater Phoenix area, but I got to tell you, it's amazing to me that you try to do an event in Phoenix, Scottsdale in the springtime, the high season with baseball, spring training going on and just all of the great activities here that make this such a great place to live. And good luck because I had one of my assistants call around to hotels here and they wanted five and ten thousand dollar a day food and beverage minimums. They wanted guest rooms, two hundred and fifty dollars a night plus plus <laughs> just a uh, it, it was amazing. So definitely not a good fit when we can do the beautiful Hyatt Regency in Irvine where we've had our events so many times and we can get you guest rooms for $99 a night. Much better to be prudent and also enjoy a great venue and enjoy fantastic California as well and use that saved money to get out of the rat race and invest in income property, a much wiser thing to do. So we want to be prudent with our investors' money. And speaking of which, we've got a couple of specials you might want to check out, and I'll tell you about those in just a moment, a couple of product specials. Now, I don't know how many of you have heard of Equator, but Equator is the system that real estate brokers and agents use and sellers use, sellers that are wanting to do distressed sale transactions. And boy, that's most home sellers nowadays or most property sellers in general, I should say. And Equator released some interesting statistics recently that said that they see nearly 1.2 million short sales were initiated through its system over the past two years. Now, remember, folks, why do I bring this up? Because remember that 1 million equals about 1% and 1% equals about 1 million. Well, what do I mean by that? We've mentioned it on the prior episodes. When you see 1.2 million short sales initiated through the equator system, that means that the home ownership rate in America has dropped by at least 1.2%. Now, what do these people all need? Well, they're probably not going to be running out to buy a new home. They've got to live somewhere, so they are going to do what? They are going to rent. And I venture to say something even a little bit more maybe politically incorrect or slightly distasteful, but here it is. Financial hardship, what does it cause? Well, many times it causes the big D word, you know, those wedding vows through better or worse, sickness and health, for richer or poorer. Well, financial stress causes divorce. So a lot of times these distressed sale households 
If they're a couple, they turn into two households, not just one, creating even more demand for rentals. And when you look at the stats, the marriage rate in the United States is the lowest it's been in decades. So things are changing. I'm not making a social commentary on this, whether it's good or bad. Actually, I kind of think it's bad. I mean, I'm single. I'd like to be married. I've wanted to be married for a long time. You know, I always thought I'd get married in my late 20s, but, you know, just never worked out that way. And, you know, listen, each obviously has its own advantages and disadvantages. Marriage, a very big decision. I guess that's life's biggest decision of all, isn't it? And it can be great when it's great, but it can be absolutely horrific when it isn't the right match. So there are obviously advantages and disadvantages to each side of that coin. But, you know, regardless, financial hardship causes divorce. There's no question about it. No one can argue with that. That's not anecdotal. It's empirical. And also the marriage rate is declining dramatically. So this means more demand for housing. Remember, you need two houses instead of one. You need two places to live, two residences instead of one. So that means more opportunity for investors. So here, here's a, a snippet on the Equator thing. Default servicing technology company Equator says nearly 1.2 million short sales were initiated through its system over the past two years. The company tracks this data through its default servicing platform, which helps mortgage industry clients deal with loan modifications, short sales, Deeds in lieu, that means a deed in lieu of foreclosure when you simply hand over the keys, hand over the deed to the property to the lender instead of doing a foreclosure, and foreclosure processing and REOs, in other words, real estate owned. Los Angeles-based Equator said Wednesday that more than $150 billion in assets have been sold using its platform over the past eight years. Analyzing trends from the recent fourth quarter, Equator said servicers heading into 2012 are focused on compliance issues. What does that mean? That means lenders and servicers of mortgages are what? They are fearful. They are afraid to foreclose because all of the scandals, all of the robo-signing, all of that stuff. So big, big things going on, big opportunities for us as investors. Now, today on the show, our guest is going to talk about the end of Wall Street. Well, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> now, I say that obviously tongue-in-cheek. Listen, folks, I know that I constantly bash Wall Street, and I think Wall Street deserves probably a lot more bashing than I give it, and a lot more bashing than all of us give it. However, the concept of a stock market is great for capitalism because it does allow middle-class people to invest in things they couldn't otherwise invest in. Certainly, and I, you know, I'm speaking conceptually here, it allows for economic growth. It's a huge engine for economic growth. But of course, in the last couple of decades, it's been so completely disgustingly perverted in every way. And the fat cats are just getting all the benefits while everybody else is getting the short end of the stick. And on that note, a recent article here I have, and this is a USA Today article, Gary Strauss says more CEOs rake in $50 million and up. And a couple snippets from this article. And I did not know this till the other day. I cannot believe it. I had no idea he was making this kind of money. But good old Tim Cook, who took over for the late Steve Jobs, three. dollars hundred and seventy eight million dollars. Wow. Qualcomm's Paul Jacobs, fifty point six million dollars. Tyco International's Ed Breen, sixty eight point nine million dollars. JC Penny. Now I don't know about you, but I thought JC Penny was kind of a dying company. Haven't kept track of them lately, but I remember from my childhood we had those old old companies, Sears, Montgomery Wards, J.C. Penney. Mervyn's obviously went out. Kmart largely went out. I thought those companies were kind of a, a dying breed, and there were new companies coming in to replace them. Well, whatever the case, I'm not sure what J.C. Penney's up to, but Ron Johnson, heading up J.C. Penney, made $51.5 million. And get this. Exit packages are even more lucrative. Neighbors Industries will pay Chairman Gene Eisenberg $126 million when he steps down, while Motorola Mobility CEO Sanjay, how do you say that? 
I don't know. Anyway, Sanjay and Temple Inland CEO Doyle Simmons are due more than $60 million once their merger is finalized. Compensation experts say that corporate directors are wrestling with oversized pay plans, but many are hampered by deals hatched by other boards seeking new talent. Well, you know what? I bet that's not really true. They say that, but in reality, as long as the board is getting a lot of money, they're going to let the C-level executives get a ton of money as well. As I've said before, I'm a capitalist, okay? I see nothing wrong with this as long as the shareholders are being rewarded proportionally and the other stakeholders. Stakeholders are not shareholders necessarily. Stakeholders are employees, vendors, other stakeholders involved with these companies. These companies are so giant nowadays that I really think that they have a social obligation to be fair with all stakeholders involved with them. I know that may sound slightly leftist. Don't worry, I'm not a leftist. And and then it goes on to say in the article here, Iger, for one, who, who stands to make a lot more under a new contract, Disney is paying him at least $30 million annually through 2015, up 43% from his old base pay. Unbelievable. What a total scheme and scam. Be a direct investor. Stop making everybody else rich. Invest in your own properties. Be a private lender. I've been doing more and more private lending myself, financing a lot of deals that you are buying, that our clients are buying, both from the end where our vendors need the financing to buy properties at auction. That's a very capital intensive business for them. Think about it. Every property might cost them sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 or more, maybe a little less at times, and they need to buy these properties at auction, hold them for four months, and turn around and rehab them, get them rent ready, many times put tenants in the properties, and then offer them to you, our investor clients. And I finance some of those deals, and you know what? If you have an interest, I suggest you do the same, because I'm earning over 12% on money that I loan out for sometimes 92 days, 94 days at a time. You know, I like that short-term lending when I get my money back so quickly. And several of our clients are doing it as well. If you're interested in this, just shoot me an email, jason at jasonhartman.com, and I will connect you with the right people. Also, subject to applicable laws, not eligible in all states, et cetera, et cetera. There's a little bit to it, but I'll introduce you to the right parties. You can find out the details. It may or may not be for you. We do have a couple of nice, big, huge discounts, actually. One discount's about 66%. The other's about 50% on two great products that you should definitely have. Number one is our Creating Wealth Home Study course. Normally, what is that normally? $297, I believe. Well, guess what? You can get $200 off and you can buy that for 97 bucks. What a deal. That's about five or six hours of audio. It includes two books, the workbook. It's an active, interactive workbook, and you can fill that out as you listen along on your iPod, in your car, at home, whatever. And it's a digital download of the audio and two PDF files, as well as a complete, beautifully done transcript of that foundational course that I teach. And thousands of people have been through it. I've taught it for several different companies over the years and it's really great. So if you go to jasonhartman.com, you select the Creating Wealth Home Study course, and you enter the promo code CW200. So Creating Wealth and a $200 discount. CW200 is the promo code. Go to jasonhartman.com, click on the products, take advantage of that. And the Financial Freedom Report. Great way to start off the new year is to be a subscriber to our highly acclaimed Financial Freedom Report newsletter. And that's where we talk about a lot of the stuff we just don't have time to talk about on the show or even at the events at the Meet the Masters event. This, this again, is a whole nother avenue, a whole nother outlet where you'll learn a lot more stuff. And you can get $100 off on that, so you can get it for only $97 as well. And the promo code FFR. FFR100, so it's the Financial Freedom Report, FFR100. 
100 is the promo code. You can get a full year subscription to that. So before we get to our guest, a couple more things I want to talk about here. In Porter Stansberry's newsletter, he says some really interesting things that totally tie in with today's show. And I just wanted to mention them here before we go to our guest, because they're very applicable when we talk about Wall Street, the end of Wall Street. We talk about the corruption of capitalism. Capitalism, a great thing, but again, like I've said before, I don't think Wall Street represents capitalism anymore. I think it has completely detached itself from capitalism, and it is now capitalism on a nominal basis. And I talk always about nominal dollars and real dollars, constant dollars, or inflation or deflation impacted dollars. And so nominal means a name only. So Wall Street's capitalist in name only. It's an insider's game. So listen to this in the Stansberry newsletter. He says, the 10 largest American bankruptcies in history have all occurred in the last decade. Lehman Brothers, $691 billion. Washington Mutual, $327 billion. WorldCom, $103 billion. General Motors, $91 billion. CIT Group, the commercial lender, about a 100-year-old company, okay? $80.4 billion. Enron, $65 billion. Conseco, $61.4 billion. MF Global, you've heard a lot about them in the news lately. We've talked about them on the show. $41 billion. Chrysler, $39.3 billion billion dollars. Thornburg Mortgage, $36.5 billion. All of these failures have a few things in common. Extremely well compensated CEOs. <laughs> what a surprise. With long tenures, which suggests that the board of directors was asleep at the wheel, my comment, or getting paid not to pay attention. Vast amounts of debt, that would seem completely unsafe by any reasonable standard, and accounting policies that deliberately misled investors. Most tellingly, in the vast majority of these cases, board members and executive management have no material investment in the company. In other words, they have basically sold off the vast majority of their shares. And I know a lot of you stock people, this is me talking, by the way, not the article, I know a lot of you stock people, you look at what the insiders are doing, right? Well, if an insider, if the CEO, if the CFO, if the COO, if the board of directors, if all those inside people, if they own a bunch of stock in the company, well, then, you know, that's a sign of they have faith in the venture, right? Uh, not so fast. Because what is quoted when you see those figures is the amount of stock they own. So say, for example, an insider bought up $2 million or $5 million worth of their own company stock. Well, all the stock investors go out and they think, gee, isn't that great? That's a sign that they have faith in the company. But the reality is they've got a $300 million net worth and they just look at, gee, if I can buy up $2 million or $5 million worth of stock and push the needle as I'm making $60 million a year or $120 million when I'm going to exit the company. It's essentially a pump and dump scam, folks. Look at how much stock they own as a percentage of their compensation and as a percentage of their net worth. I mean, that stock could be a drop in the bucket for them. It could be pennies. It sounds like a lot to you and I, but in reality, you've got to consider that in accordance with their compensation and their net worth. Then you understand how how at stake they are. One more thing from the Stansberry newsletter, and, and this is interesting too, because before I shared on the show how he talked about the late Steve Jobs, and it's always never speak ill of those who have passed away. And, you know, I love Steve Jobs, and he's done incredible things. What a great inventor, etc. But, you know, I mean, he profiled his misdeeds with Apple and how he would screw around with the numbers and the backdating and then how he hired Al Gore and covered things up. I mean, it's just rampant, folks. You've got to just assume everybody is doing it. And that's why you need to be a direct investor. Thou shalt maintain control. Commandment number three, control the things you invest in. Buy a bunch of little single family homes. Get a couple of apartment buildings. Get some notes and 
trust deeds and do some short-term private lending. This stuff you control directly. There's no middleman skimming the profits off the top. Okay, last thing from the Porter newsletter, and then we'll go to the guest here. He says, I can't name a single major Wall Street firm that hasn't engaged in massive fraud over the last decade. Not one. He's saying, not one that hasn't engaged in massive fraud over the last decade. Not one. They have all paid massive fines to the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, but in only one of these cases was any firm held criminally responsible, and that firm was Arthur Anderson, Enron's accountant. What about the bankers who actually lent the firm money against collateral they knew was bogus? What about the investment bankers who sold Enron stock to the public, even though they knew the earnings were fraudulent? And what happened to the huge corporations whose depositors, executives, and lawyers were all full active partners in the fraud that bankrupted Enron, namely Citigroup and J.P. Morgan, the two largest banks on Wall Street? It's just unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, folks... We're talking today about the end of Wall Street. Roger Lowenstein will be back with us to talk about that in a moment. Make sure you join us for Meet the Masters in March in Southern California and take advantage of those products I mentioned. Look at the properties on our website, things you own and control directly, where you have returns projected well upwards of 20% annually. And by the way, I got to make one more comment on the properties. I don't ever claim to call everything right. And you know my big prediction that has not come true that I've been talking about for years. I'm surprised interest rates are still this low. In fact, I am floored. I am shocked that interest rates are still this low. The way I called that, I thought they'd be much higher by now. How long can they kick the can down the road and and keep this house of cards afloat the way they're doing it? (laughs) it? It boggles the mind. It really does. It defies gravity. It defies logic. Another one that I totally underestimated, St. Louis. St. Louis has been an amazing success for us, that market. I've told you many times, I really like Atlanta right now. Great market. We've been doing great things there. But, you know, also I got to draw your attention to St. Louis. The properties have phenomenal cash flow. I was looking on our website the other day under the jasonhartman.com slash properties section and projected returns exceeding 40% annually. Not bogus, not hype, conservative, things that can come true in reality because income property is a multidimensional asset class. And look, if it only works out half as well, well, you make 20% annually. That can't be all bad, right? But certainly you can loan your money on short-term loans and earn upwards of 12%. So that's what we have to offer, things where you are a direct investor that you directly control, where you won't have some criminal on Wall Street skimming the profits off the top. So we will be back with Roger Lowenstein. This is a fascinating interview as he talks about the end of Wall Street here in just a moment. We'll be back in about 60 seconds. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy home study course all the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the creating wealth boot camp created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience for more details go to jasonhartman.com My pleasure to welcome Roger Lowenstein to the show. He is the author of The End of Wall Street, When Genius Failed. And I think you'll find this interview to be very interesting. Roger, how are you? I'm very good, Jason. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, likewise. Let's talk about The End of Wall Street. And you're the author of five books, I believe. But tell us about this one in particular. It seems to me that for the last 30 years or so, the financial services industry has had such a great run. and, And maybe that leads us to a bit of a bubble. There's so many scandals and problems. And tell us more. Well, I think we certainly had a bubble. Um, you know, we had you know, a huge bubble, obviously, in mortgages and in the stock market, in the business of banks, and and we've seen, you know, as you suggest, sort of a, a bunch of related bubbles or scandals about how uh, you know anything from Bernie Madoff to how the banks uh, packaged mortgages and sold them to investors and so on, and how the credit rating agencies operated, but. 
the end of Wall Street, which was the title of the book, was meant to suggest that speculation and and the notion that free markets and Wall Street could do no wrong and needed no regulation, that all these things really reached a, a peak, you know, in the last cycle, in the you know, peaking in 07 or so, and that the world that we're emerging from or into is really going to be different than, than that era, that we're going to have, you know, more regulation, less profitable banks, uh, you know, more of a government hand, uh, higher unemployment, more volatile and less exuberant stock market, people more afraid to invest in the stock market or afraid to do anything with you know money. And I think you know, you're seeing most of that uh, play out. I, you know, it, it, we read just recently how uh, bank profits haven't come back, real estate markets haven't come back. You know, whatever the new normal is, it it sure feels different to me than. Uh, pre-2007. Well, I would certainly agree with that. Now, when we talk about the end of Wall Street, Roger, I guess that really needs to be parsed up into what we consider to be Wall Street. I mean, of course, there there are the companies there, the people that own shares in those companies and, and bonds for those companies. Sure. But but also there's the financial services industry that seemed to change a lot. Uh, of course, I, my life hasn't been long enough to really know. But, you know, I kind of look at the 80s as a fundamental change when people used to invest for income. They used to be dividend investors. And, and it seems like a whole new breed took over in the 80s where it became largely a capital gains and speculation market and a market more about hot stories rather than good old-fashioned blue chip stocks that pay dividends. And, yeah, although, and income. you know, you have to, you have to remember that, that, you know, there was a fair amount of speculation in the 20s and, and, and there was also a fair amount of speculation in the 1960s, the go-go years when people were buying, uh, you know, electronic stocks. That They were the the precursor of, uh, you know, internet stocks. Uh, but you know, back today, then, but... you know, yeah, yeah, and of course, I do realize that, especially in the 20s. I don't know as much about the 60s, but were, were those were those companies back in those days more, even if they were speculative, were they companies that planned to pay dividends or did pay dividends, and the investors were still looking for income, even if it was kind of a hot story or a hot new uh, segment? Not, not, uh, not a lot of them. There were some real growth stories, uh, that I mean, growth stocks, that term really came into its own in the 60s. But let me pick up on your question in a different way, which is because uh, I do think the financial climate has changed and become more speculative and more short term. And I think there's a, a proliferation now of financial assets trading that we didn't have before, not just, by the way, in securities, but you know the choices when you get a mortgage, you, you know, do you want a fix? Do you want an adjustable? Do you want a 10 year or 30 year? And I mean, they were they're just. What do you do with your savings? Do you put it in the money market? Do you take more risk? If we go back to the 1970s, the early 70s, you, know, you really had one choice, which was uh, put it in the bank or, or stick it under the mattress. And I think what has happened since about the early to mid 70s is we've had consistent deregulation. So we've had you know more markets opening up, uh, more financial instruments. You know, more opportunities, sure, for hedging and efficiencies and all that, but but more volatility, more risk, you know, more markets that are susceptible to uh, to booms and busts. If you think about the oil market for a second, the price used to be controlled by uh, Texas oil men, basically, and then, then it was controlled by Saudi sheiks. And they wouldn't always get the price perfectly right, but now, of course, the price is uh, is controlled by uh, by markets. And you'll see the, the, the barrel of Price of barrel of crude run up to, you know, 140 dollars a barrel. And then a year later, it's back down to 40, and then it's up to 90. And because, you know, free mar or open markets, as good as they are, they are susceptible to speculation, greed, you know, fear, all this. And you know, one other very important example is the mortgage market. It used to be, you know, the local banker who decided if you qualified for a mortgage, usually and hopefully by asking some intelligent questions about your income and your family situation and so on and maybe even knew you if it was a you know he was your town banker and you know sort of halfway knew those answers before you walked in now the people who determine whether you should get a mortgage are investors around the world who've never met you have never heard of you and never will you know it's just how much demand do they have for higher yielding assets that determines whether you get a mortgage regardless of whether you jason can afford that particular mortgage and you know, I think that is that dynamic of shifting um, more and more economic relationships into a, an unregulated market setting 
has given us a very different you know, economic environment than, than we grew up in. Yeah, it's sure not. It's not the old days of Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life at the Thrift Alone, where he knew all his yeah. all his borrowers and all his depositors, is it? A- a- absolutely, where you know the banker was the most uh, respected man in town, and um, now, unfortunately, deservedly or otherwise, bankers are as you know as much in, in ill repute as our journalists you know never thought I'd see that day yeah that, that that's for sure and and the politicians too so are there more scandals on wall street now or is it the media just reporting them differently or are we more aware of them i mean people were always insider trading i'm sure and doing things they shouldn't be doing and committing financial fraud yeah well there's an old saying that you know if you didn't have uh you know, speculation and fraud, you wouldn't have had the railroads. Uh, you know, I mean, the big incentives do create, big opportunities create the incentives to speculate and, and you know, among some people to cheat. And uh, as Warren Buffett once said, you don't uh, encounter a lot of traffic when you take the high road on Wall Street. I mean, it just, it attracts um, people who there to, to make money and, and not all of them are the most ethical. The, your question, you know, whether there's more, um, I think it's very hard to know. If you, if you think of think of the 1920s or any of the decades before there was regulation, basically everybody cheated. You could say nobody did because there were no rules, so it wasn't really cheating. You know, it was it was normal for people who ran companies to um, manage the stock, to create runs, and to short their own stocks, game the investors. I mean, you know, what went on was was really atrocious. So, you know, what we've had since then is basically an increasing framework and set of rules that that restrict at least the most you know sort of naked abuses except we get periods where the abuses come running back i think you know we had it recently really because of this doctrine promoted by ultra free marketers you know including alan greenspan the head of the fed that you didn't need any regulation and um you know i think when you tell tell that to a bunch of bankers wow we can do whatever we want they, some of them will uh, now, Greenspan didn't mean that they should they should cheat and break the law. And there's no explaining a Bernie Madoff. Uh, you know that that's just no law is going to stop someone who's who. You know it's it's like passing a law against violent crime. You have it to stop the you know the 99 percent who are going to listen. There are always going to be um, you know some people who won't. I I think to the extent that banks have become bigger, more distant from their customers, I think they've become if not more fraudulent, less careful. You used to walk in, they didn't want to lend you too much money, hopefully for your good, certainly for their good. Now, they don't know you, and they don't. their good doesn't enter into it because they're going to sell that loan an hour and a half later anyway. So I think the financialization of the economy and of the financial industry has made financial firms less cautious, you know, less prudent, and less, less like bankers. Well, so like that, that, that's an interesting term you use, Roger. You know, the financialization. I, I like that. That's I, I get. I get what you're saying when you when you say that. So when you look at the regulation issue, I mean, I consider myself to be a, a free marketer and have a libertarian bent, I guess you could say. And it seems as though you're advocating more regulation. And, and this is such a complex, incredibly complex world that I don't know that the market can regulate itself because it's just too complex nowadays. But I don't know that government can do it either. You know, that's the the problem, but you know, let me just go let ahead. Me, yeah, let please. me just stop you there. Sure. I, I think when you say you're a libertarian, and I say I'm for regulation, I don't really believe we're as distant as those, we're as, as apart as those phrases suggest. Because I think we're, you know, we're all, maybe at different places on a continuum. But you they, really they do, do they do right? meet. I mean, they do kind of. Meet you do believe in regulation. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'm going to ask you. I mean, let, let's take insider trading. I mean, a lot of insider trading uh, arrests lately and convictions lately. And you know, I want to ask you, uh, you know, and, and your listeners, w- would you be comfortable in a world where when you bought General Electric stock, just picking on, just citing that as a well-known you know, corporation, where the executives would be free every time there was a development, an unannounced development to say a product was good, to buy the stock, tip off their friends, do what they want, maybe, you know, uh, hold back the good news so the stock would be cheap. Then when they wanted to sell, put out a lot of pump and dump, put out a lot of good news. You'd come in and buy it. Then they'd put out the bad news. I, I don't believe you want to live in that kind uh, of a of, world. Of so course that, not. Of course not. Of course not. So, that, so we're we're talking about what types of regulation work, what don't work, what are the you know what are the behaviors that we want to disincentivize, and so on. But 
but that's because you wanted to ask me about Freddie, Freddie and Fanny. Yeah, yeah well, you know, and, and, and here's what I was going to get to is is really not, and I know we're not that far apart in, in that vein, of course, but what I wanted to get to is is the, the concept of, you know, attacking the cause or the symptom. And when it comes to like Fanny and Freddie, the free market, the true like purist in the free market thinking would say, well, there should have never been a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. The government shouldn't be backing mortgages. The government shouldn't even be in that business at all. And granted, that would have changed the whole complexion of the real estate market for many decades past. We all, we all know that. But with, with the stated goal of, of Fannie Mae to be to promote home ownership, whenever you promote something, the price goes up, right? So that's right. That's right. And you know, let me just say that Fannie Mae was created in 1938, uh, in the mid 30s, I believe, I believe 38. But there was a federal home loan board uh, that came uh, early to mid part of the deal than Fannie Mae, and. Um, you know, it was very hard to be a purist in the Great Depression when, when you know, millions of people were being foreclosed on, in particular farmers, but no one had jobs. It was a moment when pure capitalism maybe didn't seem quite as attractive to most Americans as did, you know, somewhat adulterated capitalism. So, so they went with it. And I'll agree that it, obviously, it distorts the market. I mean, if, if, if it didn't distort the market, there'd be no reason to have it because we could just have the market. So that's, it does distort the market. And I'll also agree that I think we take a big risk. You know, if you want to support mortgages, an out front way to do it is just to pick a number, whatever the Congress approves, a billion, 10 billion, whatever is a year, and say, put them into mortgages. But when you say, we're just going to guarantee, you know, a growing number of loans every year and pretend that it's going to cost us nothing, I think that's a very risky way to do it. At least if you have the Congress say, you know, we want to support mortgages, we're going to appropriate X, X is what you spend, you know, rather than. What is it now? It's I think it's over two hundred billion that that Fannie and Freddie have cost us. It's easily the most expensive. It's part too of the it's too much. <laughs> no yeah. question. Now let me just say one other thing though, because because uh-huh. you also mentioned causes, and it's it's a widely held belief, you know, that they caused the mortgage fallout. And you know, I don't put this quite in the camp of, you know, the CIA killed Kennedy or something, but. But um, I think there's been a fair amount of conspiratorial thinking, and that you know I show in my book, Fannie and Freddie were in the business. Uh, they had a lot of business, but one of the things they were doing was putting together mortgages that they guaranteed, putting them in a package, securitizing them, and selling to investors. And private label firms, you know, you heard of Bear Stearns, you heard of Lehman Brothers, firms like that, Morgan Stanley, began to go into competition with them. And instead of taking guaranteed mortgages, they would take mortgages that weren't guaranteed. Instead of taking conventional 30-year loans, they began to take more all-day loans, which is a term for a riskier loan, more subprime loans, really riskier loans. And they began to take business away from Fannie and Freddie. And Fannie and Freddie realized that to compete, they had to hold their market share. They had to start accepting the same types of loans. And their their memos, you know, and I re- reproduce them, quote them in my book, where where they say, we have to meet the market where the market is, or we're going to lose share. And, they, and of course, they did meet the market where the market is. But the point is, the speculation, the bad loans, the uh, foolish risk taking was there before Fannie and Freddie, and they raced to catch up to emulate the what I'll call the foolish pace setters in the private market. And I agree with you, but those are the kinds of, I believe those are like distortions that occur in the market. And that's why when, when you have like government backed players, they, it's sort of nobody's money. You know, it's kind of that way on Wall Street too, when you're dealing with funds and so forth. But I know that there's not kind a lot of, of is, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's nobody's money. If it's everybody's money, it's nobody's money. I mean, if you money. think of, and then when there's so, you know, the, the, just say one thing that, you know, in the Lehman Brothers of old, which was a private partnership, Dick Fold went home every night knowing that he was on the hook for whatever the liabilities of Lehman you know, were, or his capital anyway, was all tied up in that firm. Dick Fold, of course, the, you know, the former CEO, the longtime CEO of Lehman, he was going to be a lot slower, a lot slower to put Lehman's assets into dicey real estate. Ditto the executives of Bear Stearns and all the other then private partnerships of which Wall Street was made up. It became finally the public's money, and, and the banks had a had a had a great one way option. You know, if heads we win, tails the, the public loses. Yeah, right, right. So, do you believe public it was 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 it? Yeah, I get it. Was it a mistake to not save Lehman? Well, in hindsight, 
you know, I could just tell you just about every mistake that was ever made on Wall Street. Right. I mean, should they uh, have been put in the too big to fail camp I don't, and I, I don't, uh, been bailed I don't out? think so. I mean, I think maybe it was a mistake to bail out Bear Stearns because I think that, of course, happened in March of 08, about six months before the cascade of failures in September, uh, because I think that set a tone and expectation. I know it did that that financial firms you know, would be rescued. But if you remember what happened, Lehman Week, the government had bailed out Bear Stearns, which it didn't want to do. Then Paulson f- f- fired his bazooka, quote unquote, to save, to rescue Fannie and Freddie, which he really hated doing, but which he felt he needed to do because people had assumed that they were government guaranteed and, and, the, and the U.S. government had never disputed that. And then we were sort of honor bound. We, we couldn't say, the, the Chinese and other foreign investors weren't going to understand it if we said, well, we didn't really mean it. So people were very tired of bailouts at that point. No one likes a government bailout, least of all a good Republican like uh, Hank Paulson. And Lehman's in trouble. And he says, okay, it's time for, for risk takers to bear the, bear the pain of the risk they took. You know, all that good stuff and uh, all that free market stuff that you were talking about. And in, in hindsight... All you know what broke loose, but um, the entire Congress or you know, all of it that got in touch with the regulators said, don't you dare give a penny to, to Lehman Brothers. The American public felt that way. And, you know, there was no knowing ahead of time that things were going to go downhill so fast. And by the way, there's no proof that even had we bailed out Lehman, we wouldn't have had all the trouble. I think we would have. If you look at what happened two days later, AIG was on the hook, and this time Paulson and Bernanke said, we can't take it anymore. The pain's too great. The panic's too great. We're going to step in. And they saved the AIG, and what happened? The dominoes kept falling, and they kept falling, and they kept falling. So by the time the decision came to bail out Lehman or not, the damage was done. The damage meaning all those loans had been issued. Tens of millions of people were living in homes they couldn't, with mortgages they couldn't afford to service. Those mortgages were held by banks and investors around the world that were taking tremendous losses. And, you know, someone was going to eat those losses. And I, and, and I don't think at that point there was a, a magic bullet. This conversation would not be complete without talking about what is going on on Wall Street and, and literally in the street and on streets all over the world right now. And that, of course, is the Occupy Wall Street movement. Yeah. Yeah, I was down there last week. What What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I don't think it's extremely articulate, the protests. I, I don't think they have, um, you know, much in the way of solutions. I don't even think that the um, the so-called villains that they're pointing to in many cases are the right villains. You know, look at John Paulson, the, the hedge fund investor who, who bet the right way. You know, he he bet against the mortgage bubble and helped to deflate it in his own, and they were marching on him. However, I think they're pointing out a very real problem a problem that has found expression, you know, in Occupy Wall Street and, and, and maybe even on the on the right, you know, amongst the Tea Party, which is that the American economy has not produced gains for a larger and larger part of the people for you know fifteen, twenty, now twenty five years. The median incomes are flat. Over the last cycle they're actually falling. They're falling not just for blue collar workers anymore, but even for people with a college education. And and, and you're re- and you're referring to people who have jobs so yes, that's, and, it's and even worse. We've than got nine percent yeah. unemployment. Four years after the the bubble burst, we've got a rising inequality of income. Which isn't to say that that the people at the top are necessarily doing something wrong, but it is to say that the that that the gains are all going to a narrower, narrower slice. This is not the picture of a healthy economy, and this is the premise, the reason, really, that in democracy we say go out, earn what you can, you know, speculate, make a million bucks is that we think and we believe that, that, that you're part of the invisible hand. You're doing the, you know, you're bearing the work of directing assets where they should go and, you know, most productive uses and all that. And we'll, you know, in time, make all of us richer. And for a generation, it hasn't really been working. And while Occupy Wall Street, the people there may not, may not articulate all this and they, they may not have solutions. No one has had solutions for a generation. And I think, I think that's why you see such frustration, you know, and, and, what are we going to do in this global economy? How do we, when, when the people in Chicago are basically in the same labor market as, as with people in Bangalore, that's, and that's a heck of a problem. Oh, I, I sure. believe the, free the, trade, way, the wages are so far away from equalizing that. And I'm a free trader, but I think that's the, um, 
you know, I think this is the, you know, these people are the canary in this very dark coal mine. And, you know, we're going to have to, in both parties and elsewhere, start addressing it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I've just got an interesting take on it. I, I think it's somewhat interesting that I'd love to get your opinion on before we go. And that is that when you look at the right-wing media, they're trying to vilify the Occupy Wall Street protesters as hippies and, and people that just don't know what they're talking about, anti-capitalist. And I find that remark particularly ridiculous because they say they're anti-capitalist. And I don't think Wall Street is very capitalistic. I mean, think about it. When you get to trade on lobbyist cronyism and massive amounts of scale. I, I don't think that there's much capitalism on Wall and Street guaranteed at all. Bonuses. Yeah, that's, and yeah, and, right. and, and, and and too big to fail bailouts and guaranteed bonuses. That's Soviet. Thank you. That's Soviet. Yeah. I got yeah, yeah, it's it's well, it's a, it's kind of like a fascism or feudalism. I don't know. It's not I, I capitalism. Hear it, yeah, but I'll say this: this is this is not. Uh, you know, look, I was a kid in the hippie era, and this is very different. That we weren't marching for economics back then. I mean. It was a movement of you know affluent or middle class kids who didn't like the war and you know didn't like the consumerism and materialism of society. It was a you know a cultural thing and none of us worried about jobs. By the way, when the revolution was over, we were all going to get jobs. And this is very different. This is motivated by economic frustration and economic fear and a sense of economic exclusion. You know, I think it's it's a much more classically um, anti-capitalist or, or, or anti-upper class. It's, I mean, the move in the 60s was almost a reaction to too much prosperity, you know, at least among some. And this, is, this one's tough, you know, this is tough. It is, it is. And I think, I think we have to consider maybe a more protectionist approach, tariffs. I, I don't know, but we, the whole world cannot equalize their wages in just a short amount of time. There's just way too much fallout, but we'll see where it goes. Roger Lowenstein, thank you very much. The book is The End of Wall Street. Roger, do you have a website to give out? The book is getting great reviews on Amazon, by the way. No, but the, the book's available, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and, uh, you know, wherever fine books are sold. So. And this is a fine one. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate the insights. Jason, a real pleasure. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.